Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive, neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, and exchange of ideas, arts, and culture. Today's session is guilty until proven innocent, with a question mark. Uh, the adage, innocent until proven guilty, is considered foundational to justice and the rule of law. However, the law in India does not give this adage the core significance one would expect. Our constitution permits that what is called preventive deten detention. We have laws such as the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA, which make it close to impossible to receive bail and allow great latitude to the state in declaring a case to be under UAPA. Our investigative and judicial processes move so slowly that it's not unusual for a person to be jailed in the pre-trial stage for longer than the possible sentence if convicted. Such conditions can be construed as a violation of ethical foundations of justice, also laying the ground for the misuse of law enforcement for purposes of politics and power. A panel of experts ponder uh, the question uh, and the ethical foundation of criminal justice. Uh, and today we have with us Professor of Law at National Law School of India University, Nunal Satish, Kunal Ambasta, Assistant Professor of Law, National Law School uh, of India University with Manisha Sethi, Head of Center for Criminal Justice and Reform and Research, uh, Criminal Justice Reform and Research, uh, Nalsar. Um, the full bios of both the speaker, of all the speakers will appear uh, in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and through the session, if you have any questions, comments, or observations to share with the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, the panel will address them towards the end of the session. And uh, with that, I hand it over to Manisha. Um, thank you, Lekha, very much uh, for uh, introducing the theme as well as to, uh, you know, organize a discussion around this theme, which is very, very urgent uh, at all times, but particularly uh, today when law seems to have lost any relation to any idea of justice altogether, right? It's seen as a machine of violence. In fact, you know, if you look at, you indicated some of the issues already in your uh, short introduction, and I don't want to uh, make too many uh, preliminary remarks because we do want to hear the panelists and then uh, we will go into the uh, discussion. But, you know, if you just look around and see, you know, uh, you look at every aspect of the criminal justice system, uh, you know, look at the way in which law is framed, you mentioned preventive detention laws and UAPA, but also otherwise, you know, a range of other laws, which I think Rinal might shed some light on, on NDPS and, and Money Laundering Act and so on, which are creating these kind of special venues in law, which are allowing, uh, you know, the erosion of uh, what we have, you know, understood as constitutional right to fair trial and so on. And, and the elaboration of these very special measures and these extraordinary provisions in ordinary law. So I think all of us who tend to think, you know, okay, uh, these preventive detention laws uh, or these anti-terror laws are nothing to do with me, uh, I think are harboring under the, you know, illusion that, uh, you know, the criminal law doesn't concern them. Whereas uh, I think what we're trying to do today is to show how criminal law affects each one of us and the possibility of you know, this big brother state using criminal law to, uh, uh, you know, and there's this whole question of whether law is misused or used, which we shall come to in the course of the discussion. But the possibility of all of us being caught at the wrong end of criminal law is always there. So I think as citizens, as, as people who are interested in questions of justice, I think it's the business of everybody to be interested in criminal law. Uh, you know, it's it's a time, you know, you indicated some of these issues, uh, but you just look around you. I mean, today, in today's paper in Hyderabad, uh, one of the ministers of the Telangana government has said, you know, that uh, has in fact, in fact, vowed that, uh, you know, uh, the rape accused in a, in a case, in a case of a minor, it's an egregious case of uh, 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 rape, rape of a minor girl, that the rape accused would be dealt with through an encounter. Right, so encounter killings as a policy of fighting crimes is very much with us, whether you look at UP or whether you look elsewhere, it's very much with us 
prisons are sites of great violence, almost banal violence, right? And you would uh, not be mistaken in thinking that, you know, torture is perhaps the only investigative tool that our police uses, right? So the endemic nature of violence, the endemic nature of, um, uh, of just the routine and the ordinary, uh, which uh, I think what we're trying to do today is to make that linkage between the routine, everyday, ordinary violence of law with the extraordinary, the preventive, the anti-terror law and so on, which create these special uh, regimes of, uh, you know, special legal regimes, right? So, um, and so the title is very much, uh, very, very relevant, guilty until proven innocent. The question mark is, I think, very, very important because it indicates the fact that this is this maxim, which is at the heart of, you know, the rule of law idea is actually very much under threat and under question uh, by law itself in many ways. And, and we look at that. So I, I don't want to take up too much time now. I shall hand over the mic uh, first. Who should go first? Uh, um, <laughs> Renal, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Manisha. Uh, should I begin? Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. So I think the, the uh, today's uh, topic for today's discussion, as Manisha already uh, mentioned, is guilty until proven innocent, ethical foundations of, uh, of criminal justice. Uh, so our discussion, as, uh, as both uh, Lekha and Manisha have mentioned, uh, is going to be uh, mostly on exceptions made to the so-called uh, special criminal laws and to the criminal process being in terms of definition of certain offenses or the procedural safeguards being taken away in terms of um, preventive detention, arrest, bail related laws, uh, et cetera. Uh, so what I will attempt to do uh, in my opening uh, comments is to look at the, the so-called general law as prescribed uh, in the criminal procedure code, especially. And uh, first to examine whether there's need for these special laws at all. And I will try and uh, argue that there's no need uh, for, uh, for any special law because our criminal frameworks are enough. And in fact, the general law itself has such onerous requirements, uh, which ends up making the process, uh, the punishment, uh, which is an intention in, in, in a lot many cases. Uh, further, uh, I, I will try and argue that, uh, uh, that you have, when laws add these onerous requirements, uh, liberty of individuals is unnecessarily curtailed. And I will use three examples uh, in criminal procedure uh, to, to demonstrate this. One is the laws relating to arrest, relatedly the laws relating to bail, and lastly, the question of uh, proving an offense before a court of law. So I'll begin with, with arrest. So the criminal procedure code provides various circumstances under which a police officer may arrest a person without obtaining a warrant from a magistrate. Uh, so technically, in, a, in these cases, there is no judicial oversight uh, for 24 hours until that person is produced before a magistrate. So if there's no warrant, that means nobody is really uh, applying their mind except the police officer to see whether this arrest is necessary uh, or not. So uh, the idea behind this provision in the criminal procedure code is that it's supposed to be used sparingly. Uh, if you look at laws in other countries, for instance, in the US, you have a probable cause requirement before an arrest is made. And, uh, and, and we don't have something like that. And we hand more power to our police uh, officers. So police officer can arrest a person without a warrant in a large range of offenses, even in offenses where the punishment is less serious, defined in the procedure code as an offense punishable with imprisonment for less than uh, seven years. Now, in these offenses, the police officer is required to uh, record reasons as to why they think the arrest is, is necessary. And these reasons are supposed to be then reviewed by a magistrate uh, who then uh, will decide whether the arrest was in fact necessary uh, or not. Now, the Supreme Court recognizing that a lot of arrests or most arrests are unnecessary has consistently laid down guidelines to ensure that uh, arrests are made only when absolutely necessary. Uh, in spite of this unnecessary arrest continue unabated. unabated. Uh, so it is from this point onwards that the journey of proving innocence and come back to our topic of uh, is it guilty, uh, uh, is, the person, is there a presumption of guilt? So it is since 
from this point on that the journey of trying to prove your innocence begins and the process becomes the uh, punishment. Now, justifiable reasons for arresting and keeping someone in custody could be that they may tamper with evidence, uh, they may attempt to influence the investigative process and things of that nature, that they may threaten potential witnesses, they may try to abscond to avoid uh, trial and punishment. So there you could say, yes, uh, this may be justified uh, reasons for arresting a person. But when arrests are made just to keep a person in custody and none of these grounds exist, right? Or I want to uh, question the person, right? You don't need 90 days to question uh, a person, right? I, I, again, this morning I was reading something where the argument made by the prosecution in a regular criminal case is that, uh, you know, the investigation is going on, so which is why I need the person in custody. Right? That, that seems not like a valid enough reason just because the investigation is going on if other reasons are not present for a person to be kept uh, in, uh, in long periods of custody. So therefore, in, in some of these circumstances, when these grounds do not exist, one needs to ponder as to why these arrests are being made. And I think, uh, like Manisha just mentioned, uh, in, in a case where, uh, uh, where say, egregious crime has taken place, uh, the, the only thing you hear, say, in the press is no arrest has been made. Next day, 48 hours, no arrest has been made. 72 hours, no arrest has been made. So it, it, it's made to appear as if unless an arrest is made, there is no progress with respect to the investigation. Uh, so there's that, that one level of, of, I think, pressure that comes in on the, on the police, uh, put in by the media, seeking uh, arrest as a solution uh, uh, to sort of solve the solution to the crime itself. At the same time, uh, we also um, we also see that uh, uh, it might be a deflection tactic, right? We have seen in cases where you arrest someone and say, "I solved the crime," and you might you might you might also know that the person you have in custody has nothing to do with it, right? So in in the process, you deflect the the pressure on you to to solve the so-called uh, to solve the crime. Uh, it is always interesting, uh, and and any of you can do it to examine statistics of offenses to see how many arrests were made, and this is available uh, in the report of the National Crime Records Bureau, Crime in India, which is available on their website of the, uh, of the Bureau of Police Research and Development. If you look at the statistics, you'll see a range of crimes where the arrest rate is very, very high. And then you look at uh, in how many of these cases were charge sheets filed, in how many of case, these cases were charges framed against the accused for those sections that they were arrested for, and in how many cases did convictions actually take place? And you see in, in many crimes uh, that arrest rates will be high and you start tapering down uh, as, you, as you go along the spectrum, which goes to show that the moment there's some sort of judicial oversight on the process, you see that uh, uh, the case collapses, right? Uh, so this also shows how important the role at a magistrate plays in the criminal justice system. We focus very little on the magistracy. Our focus is always on the Supreme Court. Uh, so we also need to focus on how much, uh, how important the role of that magistrate uh, is uh, in this particular context. Uh, once a person is arrested, effectively the police get 90 days to, in most crimes, to complete the investigation and file a charge sheet. The failure to submit a charge sheet will lead to the person being entitled to be released on bail. Uh, and as, I suppose as Kunal will uh, talk we see in some of the statutes increasing that 180 days uh, and more. Uh, and that, that begs the question as to whether you need that much time to complete an investigation at all. Tied to arrest is the question of bail. The Supreme Court nearly five decades ago has, has, has noted, and this is like a cliche now, that bail is the rule and jail is the exception. We keep hearing this all the time. And this has been reiterated a number of times by the Supreme Court itself. However, that is not what has been happening in practice. Now, as we segue into special criminal laws, we see the influence that these special criminal laws have on general laws. For instance, if you look at the last decade, uh, in financial crimes, you saw the Supreme Court saying that the seriousness of the crime is a good enough uh, factor to keep that person in custody. Right? So huge amounts of money involved, so therefore we will not release on bail. So there's really no connection unless, again, we go back to those basics of uh, are you tampering with evidence? Are you doing some of those uh, other things? That the, Seriousness of the crime has to have anything to do with the uh, uh, with whether bail is granted or not. But slowly we see that seeping into the general law, and so bail uh, becomes more and more uh, more and more difficult 
uh, to get even in uh, so called general uh, uh, cases and this is a clear indication to me of the trickling impact of special laws on general uh, criminal laws so do we need special laws at all and are these different uh, procedures uh, which are geared to make police investigation or police role easier uh, how can the state as we are looking at sort of the ethical foundations as well how does the state justify enacting such laws so if we were to go back to the historical origins of special laws uh, be it respect of how crimes are defined or special procedures etc in the early uh, 20th century or the late 19th century you find in uh, english criminal law a range of offenses called social welfare offenses now these were essentially things like adulteration of food serving liquor to police officers on duty and the like uh, it was felt that in terms of ensuring that food is not adulterated that uh, uh, that, that you you uh, dilute some of the standards that were already there in the criminal law and the main standard is for something to be a crime for an act to be a crime not only should you commit the act but you also should have the intention uh, to uh, to uh, achieve that consequence or you should know that the consequence is going to be achieved uh, so they started removing that they said as long as i find adulterated food in your shop irrespective of whether you knew the food was adulterated or you did it yourself we don't care we want to ensure that uh, adulterated food is not sold so we will find you uh, guilty of the offense uh the one thing that they did was the punishments were very less so even if i uh, convicted you for something like that punishment might be three months or six months so that's how they could justify something of of this nature uh there were category of people that were defined by courts as so called luckless victims right i had no opportunity to figure out whether i had uh, adulterated food in my uh shop but that that was not a concern for the state saying so oh, that that's fine it's a collateral consequence but it's only 3 months of imprisonment so it doesn't matter but uh, slowly as uh, as the criminal justice system across the world started seeing how useful something like this can be they started using this beyond this so called social welfare offenses to various other offenses uh, as well i see i've taken around 9 minutes maybe i i i speak for the sri manisha and uh, and thank you uh so uh the other thing to keep in mind is now it, it's been 20 years uh since the uh, september 11 terror attacks uh, on the us so this the quite a few studies done uh, right after the attacks the new york times did a poll uh asking its readers whether they'd be willing to sacrifice a few of their rights and liberties in the interest of national security people who overwhelmingly voted in that poll in favor of giving up their rights for a few days after uh, after the 9/11 terror attacks in that two weeks there after the us congress at, uh, enacted the patriot act as they called it with a range of measures including increased surveillance as if surveillance would uh, would help in preventing uh, the, the uh, for the attacks that was the uh, thing that the, the government uh, said there's a recent documentary on netflix called uh, turning point uh, 9/11 the war on terror which very nicely documents this entire thing that happened in the US Congress after 9/11 and how surveillance and torture was justified in uh, in saying that uh, this would stop a further uh, terror attack now the new york times then had another poll a month or a couple of months thereafter and found that the support that people had had with giving them the state uh, just a few days after 9/11 was no longer there right so it it is uh, at at this point of time that the state instead of focusing on what has really gone wrong sort of takes power into its hands and uses it uh, generally we see the same thing happening in india the congress party in 2004 general elections campaigned on repealing the prevention of uh, terrorism act quota uh, saying that uh, it's being misused and it does not necessary i guess something that would like that would be unimaginable today Uh, it would be political harakiri to say, to try and repeal an anti-terror uh, statute, and uh, so. But right after the 26/11 uh, attacks on Mumbai, we see the same government making amendments to the UAPA, bringing in back all of those provisions of quota that they just repealed a few years earlier, saying it was not uh, necessary. So courts too, when they are faced with these types of uh, situations, emergency situations, tend to defer uh, to the executive. Uh, we see that happening in the us in the like i said in the context of 911 we see a lot of these laws struck down 5 uh, 6 7 years later by the us supreme court uh, in in the indian context we see that the uh, supreme court has often 
not struck down laws like tada bota makoka etc but just laid down guidelines uh, to ensure that the law is not misused uh we saw for instance in the context of uh, confessions police officers in under tada or uh, something like this uh, happening right um so i i have a few few more things to say but i'm conscious that i uh, probably taken more time so maybe i'll i'll do that in the in the discussion uh but i i think what i want to say is like when you bring in uh, special laws and one of them is narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act ndps act and when the ndps act was enacted in the context of uh of drug trafficking we really removed a lot of protections that were there uh in the general criminal laws and because we were dealing with drug traffickers really nobody bothered about it saying this is about drug traffickers and slowly those uh, the model used in the ndps act start seeping in again to your anti terror legislation to your uh other legislations in slowly into the crpc um as well right so even if the person is acquitted at the end of the process the damage is already uh, done so we need to relook and reconsider what is the purpose of laws of this nature do they encourage misuse and do they encourage the state to frame innocent uh, persons if that happens do we really have legal recourse do we have a right to compensation if we don't uh, so questions of accountability and ethicals of uh, ethical foundations of criminal law is something uh, for us to uh, ref definitely reflect on and to see where are we heading what is the direction that we are heading in uh, with this uh, with this usage um, enactment and usage of special criminal laws and special criminal procedures i'll i'll stop there and hand it back uh, thank you munnar now uh, kunal if you would make your opening statement and then we can start the discussion okay uh thanks thanks manisha good evening everyone and uh, i i'll i'll take off from what professor mrinal has said which i agree with and i just wanted to make some points that are connected along with what he has said now uh, if if we contextualize so without any other any any further delay let me just get into what i want to say if we contextualize the use of these special laws in india under the indian legal system there is a very curious uh, case of how these things have developed over time in, in in the indian legal system we see the first kind of special laws of the type that professor minal was talking about which give a vast discretion to police officers to arrest or even to take people into preventive custody prior to anything happening at all just that the police officer believes that something may occur on that basis to arrest someone indefinitely we start seeing all of this in the indian legal system in the colonial era where the british government the colonial government starts enacting what are generally called public safety acts and these acts are enacted province by province so there's one of this in let's say the bombay presidency there's one in bengal there's one in madras etc etc and all of these laws seem to give almost unrestricted powers to the executive the district manager uh, magistrate or the police to place people under preventive custody and this was of course a political exercise of a judicial power given to the executive in order to stifle political activity that was led by indians now but this spreads and it is used by the colonial government against indian politicians and freedom fighters almost indiscriminately we also have several such other laws one notorious one was called the linlithgow ordinance in of 1942 which was promulgated by the then administration to quash the quit india movement which had started in the same year and had brought the british administration to a paral paralytic stop in several places and this act this ordinance itself gave vast powers to the police and to the armed forces to do whatever it was necessary to break any resistance that was offered to the government it was justified as a special means that was necessary at that point of time because britain was facing and waging the second world war effort and therefore they said that this is a matter of national security so what you see is a recurrent theme of public security or public safety that also connects to public welfare which professor minal was talking about 
so terrorist offenses are not just general offenses but are considered to be offenses against public security public safety at large food adulteration at a much lower level is also considered something which will affect public welfare if people get poisoned because of adulterated oil or milk or whatever etc etc but what these laws routinely do is that they vest these extraordinary powers away from the general principles of criminal law and into an executive kind of discretion which is almost unrestricted now very interestingly what happens is cut to 1947 when we have independence and the constitution starts to get drafted a lot of the people who drafted the constitution were people who had been arrested by the british under these laws you take nehru you take rajendra prasad all of these guys had been arrested and placed in custody for prolonged periods of time by the british government so the constituent assembly which is drafting the constitution is very cognizant of what these special laws can do essentially treat people as guilty without holding the trial and the constituent assembly very clearly says that in the in independent india we will ensure that this does not happen right? so they draft articles and upon articles into the constitution which guarantee personal liberty so you have something like article 21 you have something like article 20 which gives you a host of criminal procedure rights you will not be forced to give evidence against yourself you will not be put on trial for one offense more than once etc etc so they were very cognizant that special laws can be used as mis as as agents of mischief in the hands of any government no government is beyond misusing these laws so they put in these safeguards what happens then using these provisions several high courts across the country started striking down these laws these british era laws that allowed for preventive custody and please i i apologize my neighbor's dog when he starts barking then there is nothing to stop it so you might hear that in the background but so what what happens is that high courts start striking down these laws and they say that this is incompatible with the constitution the constitution now guarantees citizens rights these laws do not allow for those rights to be exercised they are unconstitutional and they strike them down very interestingly the same government which has which was the first government that primarily had people from the constituent assembly in the cabinet sardar vallabhbhai patel and different members of the congress also had led the freedom movement in various ways they panic at this juncture that the state's power to control is going away and the central government or the union government responds by creating its own preventive detention laws so the first preventive detention law in post constitutional india was passed in 1950 very quickly after the bombay high court and the patna high court struck down the preventive detention laws in those two provinces and they also amended the constitution to create a safe harbor for laws that would not be tested on judicial review and a lot of these preventive detention laws and special criminal laws started getting put there now why is this story important it's 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 an insightful story for us to understand what this genesis of this of of doing away with rights of the accused is it is always couched in the language of public security safety etc etc as you will see today is happening with terror offenses or offenses dealing with narcotics that the argument always is that this class of accused is different and this class of accused does not deserve this right of being presumed innocent and it stretches into many provisions so you can be arrested on mere suspicion once you are arrested bail can be denied to you we are now seeing provisions in law such as the uapa section 43d which are effectively and clearly stating that bail will not be granted at a particular stage if the prosecution shows even a prima facie or a very at a very basic level if the prosecution shows that something has happened in this particular case the case exists so what is all of this doing effectively you still have your article 20 right you still have your article 21 right it's there in the constitution you can frame it up and put it on your wall but through these laws effectively you cannot exercise these rights and we are seeing several cases today where people are arrested on charges of relating to national security or even terrorist offenses are invoked routinely 
And effectively, that means that your life for the next one year is at a standstill because you are not going to get bail. You are going to be put under this indefinite kind of arrest and investigation that does never stop. And if the presumption of innocent or being presumed innocent till you are proven to be guilty has to mean something, then this seems to be fundamentally incompatible with that. How can I be put in jail for two years, three years, four years down when there has been nothing proved against me? But that is what these laws are allowing the state to do. And Professor Miran Satish also is absolutely right that if you notice the genesis of these laws, they come at times when there is large scale support from people like us, I mean civil society, for the state to enact these laws. We don't think at that point of time that this law is going to be used in a particular way. So, so let's say a big terror attack happens, all of us rally together and say, no, we need a very strict law, we need this, we need that, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point of time, we don't really imagine that this law is going to be misused. But go down a couple of years and you'll see that college professors, students, activists are being arrested under these laws. So what happens to these people when they are arrested? And that's essentially, looking at you know being presumed guilty if you are arrested under these laws you are effectively being presumed guilty because in theory you might still be innocent but what use is that innocence if you are not going to get bail what use is that innocence if you are going to lose two years of your life awaiting trial and that's essentially the theme of this this the, the evening's talk also is is our justice system especially our criminal legal system have we moved away from this cardinal principle saying that we, you cannot presume someone guilty? Have we started doing that? And I think through these laws, that is precisely the kind of phenomenon that has started. I'll, I'll stop there and hand over back to you, Manish. Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank you, Rinal, for giving us uh, really a bird's eye view of the issues that are at stake here. You know, I looked up the question of arrest, the question of bail, the question of well, the presumption of innocence and how it is sort of distorted uh, within these uh, special laws and so on. And, and Kunal, thank you so much for kind of tracing that lineage of, uh, you know, the present, where, where we come to, you know, from and from where. So thank you, both of you. So um, I, uh, you know, to start off, I want to ask uh, Mrinal, perhaps first, you know, you spoke about uh, judicial oversight. Right, you said you know that there is this, of course, I mean, the, the the number of arrests and then the kind of taper off and and peter off and uh, finally those who are charged and then those who are even held guilty is much less, right? But uh, you know, if we, one were to look at the ways in which, and I I'm, I quite agree with you that one has to focus now on the lower courts. You know, we tend to think of uh, these higher courts, the Supreme Courts, as producing law and really the magisterial and the sessions court is, you know, being outside. So I completely agree with you that our focus has to be there. But I was just wondering, on you know, there are people who get acquitted, as Kunal was pointing out, after years in jail. Sometimes, you know, Amir, Amir Khan spent 14 years in jail, Nasiruddin spent 19 years in jail, right? So at the end of it, I mean, is one to celebrate, uh, you know, uh, this uh, their acquittal as some kind of triumph of you know due process and so on because i mean what is the kind of judicial oversight that is actually happening at earlier stages you know for example if you were to look at amir khan's court documents you would wonder why any magistrate allowed you know him to be charged right why wasn't his case you know thrown out at the first instance so is there a problem or for look at you know the whole question of torture there are affidavits that are filed by accused in court saying that we are we've been tortured uh, in the period of uh, you know police custody and in fact there are marks of torture on, on their bodies but the, i mean it's and i mean i'm talking especially about terror cases but that's also holds true for other cases as well and that there is uh, some kind of i don't know abdication perhaps uh, is maybe a too strong a word but uh, certainly uh, you know looking away by the judiciary you know uh, and uh, on these questions. So your thoughts on that? Because as you know, somebody who's looking closely at criminal law and criminal trials. Yeah, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, acquittal after 17 years, 19 years would be a celebration of the, of, of the due mm -hmm. process. 
and I like I mentioned earlier, what after that? Uh, mm-hmm. We like if we don't really have a jurisprudence where we're going to hold someone accountable uh, for mm-hmm. what for why they landed up uh, landed up being in prison for that many years uh, and when they were innocent and probably framed for it. Uh, I, I think the mistake uh, with the Indian criminal justice system and at least the approach to the Indian criminal justice system has been this entire focus on higher courts, on, on the high court and the Supreme Court. And, and a framing of the, uh, of the issue as uh, that, that, that the, uh, the, the, the uh, magistracy or the, or the district courts in general really don't have anything to do with the constitution. Uh, that's mm-hmm. what the Supreme Court and High Court used to say earlier. Uh, that's what, again, I think civil society, academics, people said, oh, you know, that, that's not where sort of constitutional discourse happened. It happens mm-hmm. uh, higher up. And in, in doing that, I think we ceded the accountability that we need to have towards these, uh, uh, towards the district courts themselves. Right. And, and uh, again, of course, there are, there are situations where uh, uh, so see, the, my broader question would be what happens and, and like you said someone is in custody for long periods of time so what is the consequence uh, who are you going to hold accountable for that similarly in the context of unnecessary arrest for example we have as I mentioned the Supreme Court in Arnesh Kumar talking about the magistrates having the responsibility to look at whether the arrest is necessary or not and then it says if the arrest is unnecessary, the Supreme Court says if the arrest ended up being unnecessary and not following the guidelines, you will take the uh, departmental action against the magistrate and the police officer. What's the use? Uh, mm-hmm. At the end of the day, w- what happens to the person who's been wrongfully arrested? So if you're b- holding departmental inquiry as the consequence that happens, neither is the magistrate going to actually uh, pull up the police officer because you know, some sympathy towards that person saying, okay, this does happen once in a while, or uh, maybe you will not refer the magistrate for a disciplinary inquiry. So again, that question regularly gets asked, I'm sure in, in work in prison said, okay, the person asks you that, look, uh, the guidelines were not followed in my case. So now what? Uh, and we don't say in our law that now what means that everything, all the evidence gathered till this point of time will not be considered. Uh, we will exclude everything that is gathered to this point of time and, and, and those sort of solutions we don't have. So I think what we're doing uh, 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 with respect to uh, uh, all these exceptions also that we uh, that we provide, even in, in terms of uh, being able to use illegally obtained evidence uh, or, uh, or being able to use, uh, again, I don't want to get too technical, but in the context of the Indian Evidence Act, uh, if you make a confession, and that confession leads to so-called discovery, you can use that discovery. So what are you saying? I can torture someone, get a discovery, and that's fine, right? And again, uh, so some of some of these things where, uh, where, where, we, uh, where there's an element of accountability, but accountability leads nowhere, is I think the, the reason why, uh, why things end up failing, where, where things start going wrong. Uh, because there's nothing, nothing except a rap on the knuckles probably, that is happening to either the the police officer and and, and as you as you would know yeah yeah as you would know a, a, a charge sheet in the middle where I was talking about uh, arrest charge sheet uh, and charging a police officer in the charge sheet would add whatever they can think of every single sex section in the world that they can possibly think of and it's only a charge where you say okay why are all of these sections uh, even applicable and then I'd go back to say. Uh, that, that's where the magistrates and magistrates have been told all along that you should not interfere in the investigation. It's only when a charge sheet is filed uh, that your role really comes in. Uh, you, you take, you, take uh, you accept the charge sheet and then the pretrial process begins. So don't interfere till that point, point of time. I think that that's where the problem is. Because the magistrates on, on day one, while remanding the person to custody says, wait a minute, what is the relevance of this section? Which has happened recently, of course, in, in some mm-hmm. uh, cases, uh, uh, thing of when the magistrate says what's the relevance of the section the police have no answer to that and i say no i'm going not going to remand to custody for this other uh, offense that is that won't even uh, for which we should not even uh, even arrest be arrested right so i think that that's that sort of according to me that's the failure where we be not holding 
people accountable for what they're uh, what they're doing wrong. And even if uh, accountability is not in terms of uh, sort of punishing them, but I think the best way to say is whatever you have collected, you're not going to uh, use like you would uh, in the US, for instance. Uh, I think is is the way to go forward. Kunal, would you like to weigh in on this? Because I think you also rep you've done a bit of lawyering yourself. So, I mean, what has been your experience of, of uh, you know, yeah, representing I, I, some of it? I agree that uh, you know an acquittal after seven years or ten years of custody or sixteen years of custody is no sense in in no semblance that of justice. And just to contextualize for people who who may have read about this, these are people losing the best years of their lives arrested when they are in their early 20s and finally acquitted in their late 30s. And it's happening routinely. And the question to ask is what, what was happening for these 17 years? And why did, why did it take this long A? And why was the person never released? You know, I can fight a case as long as I'm at home. I can go on the, it's, it's tedious and it's still a punishment, but I can go to court on the date that my case is listed and rest, I can lead my life as normally as I can. That's also not very possible if you're charged with terror, nobody is going to talk to you or you are going to find it difficult to do even normal things. But the question to ask is why was this person kept in custody for 17 years and then acquitted? So where is the justice in that, that you first arrest someone, you deny them bail, you keep them in custody for 20 years, and then you say finally that now you're acquitted, you're free to go, we've upheld some great notion of justice. What is also happening, and uh, this is something that I've seen in my practice as well, is this, because of this denial of bail, a, a very uh, different kind of practice has started in courts, which in Hindi is being referred to as the practice of kati across Delhi and the northern region of the country. And it's happened in Bangalore and Karnataka as well, which is that put, put your place, put yourself in, a, in the place of an accused. Now, you have been in custody, let's say, for four years. The trial is just starting now. You are not going to get bail. The trial stretches on interminably in front of you. You don't know after the trial is over, are you going to get convicted? Are you going to get acquitted? You might be innocent, but you don't know what is going to happen. You are not a lawyer. And this might take 20 years or 15 years. So what's happening is that the accused are now, after several years of incarceration, after having lost hope, after having their spirits broken by this system, are just pleading guilty. They are changing their plea to that of guilt. And they're saying, I'm going to plead guilty. Give me the time. Punish me with the time that I've already served. And this kind of practice has really started where let's say an accused pleads guilty after eight years of being in custody, the court convicts, says you have served eight years, that's your punishment, now you're free to go. So the accused goes as a convicted man, he is free finally. And the prosecution walks away with a verdict of victory, that they have won, they've proved the case of terror. And there are many cases like this, the Chinnaswamy blast case in Bangalore was one like this, where the accused suddenly after several years of trial, change their plea to that of guilt. How is this happening? This is happening because you did not give them bail. If they had gotten bail, they would have fought the case. And who knows what would have happened at the end. They might have been acquitted. So one other statistic that one can see is the conviction rates that a lot of investigative agencies are talking about recently. And some investigative agencies, the premier investigative agencies are tom-toming a very high rate of conviction in terror cases, 90% and above. But one must dismantle this. How are you getting the conviction? If you're getting a conviction like this, that you force someone to stay in prison for 10 years, then that poor man gives you a, gives you a guilty plea. And then what's the value of that uh, confession? What's the value of that conviction? So what is it that we are doing to our justice system? Because there is no safeguard that you and I will not be accused of terror tomorrow. Because it's not, we think of these laws as being invocable and against someone like Kasa. But today it's being invoked against a lot of different kinds of people. So where do you go with this? It's not, it, so we are deviating very far from all principles of fairness, kinds of justice, etc. that we might want to think about. And on, on the judicial oversight, even if one restricts themselves to the high courts and the Supreme Court, what, what is the most common theme is perhaps not abdication, 
but a great sense of deference that the courts have shown on matters of public security. And something like this is happening very as we speak as well, where all that the government has to get up to court in and say is that this is a matter of national security. Listen, we know best. We know what's the threat of terror facing this country. You have to give us a free reign to deal with this problem. It's not like your ordinary murder and robbery and decavity, etc. This is a massive, massive threat. Please give us and let us use all the powers that we want to use. And most often than not, you see courts defer to that assessment. Right? Because we have this, this way of thinking is so ingrained now in us that we see terror as something monstrous and different and not ordinary. So you get away with all kinds of measures also in the name of terror. So if you look at the history of these litigation, even at the Supreme Court level, these laws have been challenged time and again for their constitutionality. So uh, Professor Mrinal was talking about confessions being recorded under TADA, which is not allowed under ordinary law by police officers. It had been challenged. Same under POTA. But most of these times, the courts do not go and strike down these laws. They defer to executive assessment. And they start giving guidelines, etc., etc., which is which is not very difficult to circumvent if you are a police officer investigating these crimes. So we have gone into this method of thinking where we believe the state's logic, that terror is different, which is why when a, when a heinous crime happens, then people like you and I also start saying, no, this person, you see how society reacts to crime. And same thing that you're seeing in Hyderabad now, the police, uh, the, the people are demonstrating and protesting that somebody has to be caught. Right? So the, we have a very short-sighted view of criminal law policy. And we are in this, in this situation of agitation when we are horrified and uh, we are angry, we, give, we end up giving the state powers that it uses against all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Puna. So, you know, on this, I mean, I'm glad you bring up this whole practice of Katri because it kind of tells us how the structure of the law itself spawns these kinds of practices, which are in some gray zone of, you know, legality and illegality. We can't really quite pinpoint to where they sort of, uh, you know, belong. So, um, and as you say, the UAPA perverts the whole question of fair trial, you know, bail provisions ask you to prove your innocence at the start of a trial. And obviously, you know, the way in which uh, the constitutional guarantee of fair trial, etc., and the right to uh, dissent, etc., is criminalized. I mean, there, there's been a lot of discussion around this recently, especially in the aftermath of the Bhima Koregaon and the uh, Delhi cases, right? So there's been a lot of writing, in fact, uh, on various, uh, in various even mainstream uh, press and so on, about the ways in which, uh, you know, it kind of uh, UAP and laws uh, no, I'm, I was saying that there has been a, a lot of discussion at the ways in which uh, laws like sedition and UAP, etc. are used to criminalize dissent. And on the one hand, you know, this whole perversion of uh, the idea of fair trial, but also constitutional rights of dissenting and so on, you know, free speech, a right to association and so on. But I was saying that there's perhaps another stake here, uh, which is uh, the ways in which these loose definitions of terrorism terrorist gang, et cetera, et cetera. The sheer arbitrariness of definitions in, in, in laws like these and the kind of latitude, uh, the subjective latitude that the executive has in defining, okay, who's a terrorist. The way in which, uh, you know, uh, uh, they allow the labeling of certain social groups, not just political groups with certain ideologies or with certain beliefs, but certainly, you know, social religious groups. Like, for example, during the Tata years, it was the six. And, you know, now, of course, with the UAPA, it's overwhelmingly Muslims, right? So, um, you know, for example, in the Delhi, uh, if you look at the Delhi FIR, you know, the, in the Delhi riots case, it, it's a bizarre piece of uh, document. It's, it's a really bizarre document because it implicates everybody, not just those who are protesting, but uh, those, you know, the owner of a school, uh, Muslim owner of a school, the Muslim doctor who attended to those who were, you know, uh, uh, injured in the violence, ordinary people who had supposedly taken their children off school that day because they knew in advance that there would be violence. So there's a kind of implication by association, right? So, uh, I mean, generally, we don't tend to think of criminal law as a terrain on which citizenship questions are, you know, uh, 
being contested or staked out. But I do think that there needs to be much more attention on the ways in which questions, you know, so there is the ways in which this anti-terror laws allows for the marking of the anti-national, you know, and, and then fills it in with certain ethnic uh, or religious markers. So I was just thinking if uh, you would like uh, Kunal especially uh, uh, to make a comment or to comment on the ways in which criminal law then kind of relates to questions of belonging, citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps drawing from your own you know, uh, work and uh, also practice of law. Yeah, I, I, I sincerely believe that criminal laws especially are political and they are the easiest tool and the most pervasive tool in the hands of a state to invoke. Every activity can be governed through criminal law if the state decides to do it. And your example of the UAPA is especially instructive because now if you look at the UAPA after the recent amendments to it, it covers everything and anything. You can be a member of an unlawful gang or an association, a member of a terrorist gang or an association. You could have committed an act of terror or you could have just committed an unlawful act. So what is left? Now it's no longer the special has become and replaced the general. Right? So anything and everything can be fit under this extraordinary law that was brought when? That was brought because something like 2611 happened in Mumbai. So you see how the law comes and the state's invocation of this necessity there at that situation and how it dilutes in practice. And it's very clear how these laws are used for political purposes. In fact, POTA was repealed and it was debated in parliament that it is being misused for political purposes. Opposition leaders were being put under POTA and by different state governments, but it happened in Tamil Nadu, right? So, Criminal law we have to accept is, is a political tool, which is why there must be so many principled limitations on what a state can do with criminal law. The moment we say that now the state can arrest you without warrant, keep you in custody for 180 days, keep you in custody for two years, you are taking off that limitation, but the, na the political nature remains the same. So now the state is going to use this power when it wants to use it. And you don't, you've given away all the safeguards by making, by giving leeway to this kind of special legislation, etc. So if you look at the riots or protests that are being criminalized using this extraordinary legislation, the point is very clear that if the state does not like you, and you could be a community of people, you could be a, a certain category of people, then it's going to invoke its most strenuous powers against you. And the nature of this suspected terrorist changes. In the 1980s, it was a Sikh person. Right? Today, it is someone else. Today, it's another community. Tomorrow, it will turn to something else. Tribals in Central India can also be this category. A religious minority can be this category. So it's absolutely essential for us to always remember what criminal law can do. And this is precisely the reason why there have to be principal limitations of criminal law. The moment you let go of these limitations, you start on the slippery slope of sliding all the way down. So what was exceptional at one point of time meant for someone, let's say like a foreign, you, you know the image of a terrorist, a heavily armed person, right? Is now invoked against anyone, but who's responsible for this? We let this happen. Right? And we let this happen every time a crime occurs that especially horrifies us. So that's, that's the nature of the beast. Thanks. So I will ask one last question to Mrinal before uh, we move on to taking questions from the audience. Mrinal, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about ethical foundations of uh, criminal law, and there have been so many committees, commissions that have, uh, you know, advocated for some kinds of reforms, right? But each each recommendation, each commission has more or less ended up expanding, uh, you know, or at least recommending the expansion of police powers, recommending the expansion of uh, the category of criminals, criminal, criminal offenses, and so on, right? And, and uh, so is there, is there a way out of this impasse? Is, can there be, what, in what ways can we imagine an ethical foundation of criminal uh, reform, right? And, and, and I think it's not simply the state-appointed committees, which are often guilty. Many times activists belonging to very democratic, uh, you know, movements also argue for greater criminalization in, in a whole range of laws, right? 
So there's this tendency towards uh, perhaps, I don't know, hypercriminalization. I think we are all guilty of that. And so where, how do we kind of, uh, what are the resources, what are the kinds of resources that we can look at to create some kind of ethical uh, you know, model of criminal reform? Because God knows that we, don't, we do need criminal reforms urgently. But what, what, we, what would, could be the nature of those reforms and what could be the normative structuring principle of those reforms? If you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, I think I agree with you and with the entire issue of hypercriminalization, we see criminal law as a solution to everything. And we mm -hmm. see, like I mentioned earlier, not only criminal law as a solution, we see the person being arrested and in custody as a solution. So, uh, so, and so anything that happens in society, the first thing is let's have a new law, let's have a new criminal law, and let that new criminal law be like the NDPS Act. Uh, so, it, it, it's not even a thing of, yeah, it, uh, uh, like for instance, uh, when we had uh, attacks happening on doctors, uh, hospitals and doctors by patients, yes, you probably need a law to deal with that, but then you do need a NDPS like uh, like legislation which says no bail, uh, 180 days in custody, uh, etc. So I think that that again, I like I see someone has uh, put the question in the Q and A box of, uh, and Kunal mentioned as well that when something happens, we react immediately and we want an instant solution and the instant solution we see as criminal. I think that is where the problem. Uh, uh, essentially flows from. And once we've got that instant solution, then we forget about the solution. We, we don't see what has happened to that solution that we are actually, uh, that we had created. And uh, just going back to your previous question to Kunal as well, in terms of definitions, uh, there's something called the Railway Property Unlawful Possession Something Something Act, right? Now, uh, now in the context of Kati and the other, the obvious equivalent plea bargain, uh, and and uh, like you said, the uh, committee set up to uh, suggest reform. The law commission, the Malimad committee, and everyone said, you know, the only way to reduce our problem of delay in criminal trials is to get plea bargaining. And we should get plea bargaining in because of the fact that it's worked in the US. And that itself shows that this was not researched because if you said it worked in the US, that means you didn't look at what has, was happening uh, in the US. And on that ground, we brought in plea bargaining uh, into the CRPC in 2005. And why I talk about the Railway Property uh, Unlawful Possession Act is we have railway property across the entire country, right? From railway tracks in every village, to now metros uh, here. So what is a railway property? Uh, so if when you enacted the legislation, what did you envisage? Who were you trying to uh, or criminalize with respect to unlawful possession of railway property. Was it an engine? Was it the entire bogey? Was it a uh, whatever blanket in the AC compartment in the train? And who are you prosecuting? If you look at prosecutions under that act, we are prosecuting rag pickers. Why? Because they pick up those, I don't know what you call it, the, the stones on the, on the tracks, right? Or you pick up a nut of the uh, track, which in whatever, when they're maintaining the track, they've taken it out and thrown it aside. And I, as a rat picker, go and pick it up. Now, I'm in possession of railway property, unauthorizedly, and I have a minimum sentence of one year if I have that with me. Right? So, we never bothered and, uh, as a as society to see why do we have legislations of this nature? And because we were not the people getting impacted by uh, something uh, like this. And so like Kunal said, if you look at data on plea bargaining and, and some of the, some, some work that I done in Madhya Pradesh, the highest number of plea bargains of people who are, uh, uh, who are, uh, who are being FIR registered by the railway police under this act. And so when you start seeing something like the Railway Property Act working for you, then you say, why don't I introduce this in uh, my terror legislations as well, vague definitions, which can, which, which can work wonderfully for us, uh, for them, for, for the state the last 40, 50 years in dealing with, uh, uh, with people who you said, look, I know, and, and this goes back to saying that, oh, I know this person is a thief. I can't find that person guilty for any other thing. So let me find the Railway Property Act to hold this person, uh, hold this person liable. So uh, in, in terms of the ethical, uh, uh, ethical foundations, uh, I think it, it, uh, the entire focus of 
uh, of of any sort of law reform has to be to ensure. I, I know it's going to sound cliche that we uh, we we keep in mind that there were some core values uh, like Kunal mentioned that we had in mind when we framed the constitution. But in 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 the context of uh, in the context of of criminal laws, we keep talking about this 1860 penal code, which has lots of problems. I don't think it's the 1860 code which has problems. It is the laws we enacted after 1950 uh, with, to to bring in all the laws that. Uh, were used uh, by the British uh, in that, uh, especially in the 1930s and 40s, that are creating uh, problems in terms of either definitions and procedures, etc. So I think our focus has to be not only uh, uh, sort of enacting these laws and leaving them be, uh, but also questioning as to why, uh, why, how, and why are they being used. And there, I would say that uh, that, that job, who's doing that job, right? we are leaving that to a handful of uh, people to do that sort of uh, job academics are not doing it journalists are not doing it uh, researchers are not uh, uh, are not doing it and i don't think lawyers are well placed to do it because of the fact that they have their individual case uh, before them so i think it, it it's a wider uh, sort of questioning of when laws come in uh, to see whether we need some some sort of those provisions are they vague because criminal law Uh, by its definition, is supposed to be clear uh, and uh, something that um, is certain. And I think that certainty of the criminal law is going away as we as we move out, uh, as we bring in all of these uh, all of these definitional changes and procedural changes. And I think that's where our focus of law reform has to be on to see whether uh, what's the purpose of why you're are doing that and keep questioning. Uh, uh steps taken un- uh, under these legislations uh, going forward so like kunal said we enacted uh, uh, the uapa uh, changes uh, in reaction to 2611 keeping kasab as the as the man uh, because of whom we were doing it but you can't prosecute kasab under that right and so therefore you you sort of fooling the public saying look uh, this is what we will stop it other kasab by using this and and like i said exactly what they did in the context of 911 saying that we will not let another uh, attack happen but we will spy on each of our citizens emails to see whether they are uh, saying anything against the government uh, so i think that that's the focus uh, that should be that we again as as civil society also need to uh, need need to not just sort of check out once the law is laws are enacted but to keep ourselves informed and abreast of uh what's actually happening and how these laws are being used um thank you very much munal uh, that's a tall order because uh, in today's time you know these values these constitutional values you know seem to be at their lowest in in uh, you know in, in terms of legitimacy it seems that you know they do not enjoy the same kind of legit- legitimacy that they did even in you know when when many of these laws were framed so it's it's a difficult and uphill task and i suppose uh, everybody has to play a role in that uh, so thank you uh, and i but i just wanted to point out that you know, that, that uh, example of the railway properties act is very very instructive because it tells you not only that uh, provisions of extraordinary law seep into uh, you know common law, uh, general ordinary criminal law but that ordinary criminal law can also have an effect on uh, you know that it's a two way transaction really between extraordinary and the ordinary and in that context there is this excellent study by john dyan of uh, looking at how you know that guantanamo didn't emerge out of nowhere uh, that you know there is this whole two decade long of litigation in the us which kind of weakened the threshold of torture the, just the definition of torture how that was weakened over a period of time through court cases you know where everybody from um, Uh, you know prison managers to correctional officers to lawyers uh, to public pros- you know state prosecutors to the court itself were engaging in this kind of verbal sort of gymnastics to say okay this is not torture really this is you know something below torture so and so that that connection that he's making and i think that that's important to keep in mind how or, or what you were pointing to earlier you know the indian evidence act which allows actually material recovered through torture to be used as evidence right so the endemic nature of violence with an ordinary criminal law and that how that relates to you know what then comes to congeal and extraordinary law i think that is very very instructive so thank you for that and uh, i think some many of the questions in fact uh, both uh, of you have answered 
and uh, you know and we've gone over these uh, questions and and there's always a question uh, which is about what are we to do now and what is the solution which i'm very happy i don't have to answer but if any of you would i, I think you partly answered that you know what is to be done <laughs> and uh, but if kunal would you like to say something on this uh, you know the expanding powers of the state and the, the refusal of the courts to sort of intervene um, well, it, how do we I agree with what Professor Menal said. There is no easy way out of this to say that suddenly the state is going to stop doing this when it has nothing to lose in trying to do this and everything to gain through its, uh, through its methods. So unless there is a very strong principled civil society pushback, then it, it, it's not going to happen. So as, as Professor Menal was saying, you cannot turn off once the law has come and say that now the job is done. That's a very myopic and you know, short-sighted view of trying to say that uh, the problem can be solved. But it, it cannot be. And in, irrespective of what your political ideology is, I think this is the basic nature of the state. And perhaps a political scientist would say that, yes, the state always tries to get more and more powerful. Civil society has to keep that border in check because the state will always try through one justification or the other to overstep that part. And when you invite the state to do this, because you are particularly horrified by a crime, or you want to say that we are not like this and therefore we need a crime to deal with these monsters, which is the language that is used most often, which is nothing but a language of otherization. These people are as much part of our Sikh society as we are. But though, because we want to distance ourselves, we say, no, those guys are monsters, et cetera. That kind of tendency, a knee-jerk reaction is always going to empower the state. So I agree with what Professor Minal has said. There's no easy way out at all. There, I accept reiterating the principal stance that we must take against this. Hmm. Um, thank you, Kunal. I think we've kind of responded to all the questions in some manner. Um, there's uh, one question, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Manish, yeah. Uh, yeah, we yeah. also have a question from uh, Arvind uh, Narayan. I've just permitted him to talk okay. and he will he will ask it and then we can take the yes, please, question Arvind. after that. Hi, hello. Hi, uh, hi yeah, Manisha. Yeah. Hi, Minal and Kunal. Hi, thanks. hi. <laughs> thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the important discussion, I think, which we're, which we're having. And um, I think my comments are more in the form of uh, possibly taking some of the what you what you have said forward rather than a question. One specific question, though, the Kunal you referred to the striking down of the preventive state preventive detention laws by Bombay High Court, Patna High Court. I was wondering on what grounds that striking down happened. I asked that also because the if you look at the the the, the debate around 2021-22. Um, you presented a slightly more uh, optimistic view of, of, I thought, 22, you know. But then one other reading of the CAD debates is, I mean, of course, one, to put it very, very strongly, you'll, you'll make the argument that Article 22 is an un undemocratic heart of the Indian Constitution, you know, because it, it authorizes mm -hmm. preventive detention. So then is the question, yeah. for example, that there's fundamentally a problem with this relationship. Again, but I think there's an answer to that. I was wondering whether you have an answer. In terms of the reading of the relationship in 21 and 22, and Ambedkar's particular argument, you have to read, uh, read 22 narrowly. You can't read it in a broad way. So, other ways, what are your thoughts? You think you can read it within the framework of the law, or could you, or you think that it's fundamentally, I mean, messed up? You can't do much with 22 as it as it does, and and as Manisha's words, you need a very very tall order. Actually, it's not my point. A very very tall order of reform, which actually uh, there's a talk on the Gauri, Gauri Lankesh's anniversary, which <laughs> Gautam Bhatia made the point that uh, 22, you can't do anything with. We have to think of a uh, reform kind of a thing. At which point, of course, uh, Tista took a deep breath and said, uh, uh, Gautam, that's a very, very, very tall order. And so that was the thinking. So, I mean, because as a lawyer, you have to think within the framework we have. Mm -hmm. And what are the possibilities we have now? It may not be the most um, logical viewpoint. That's point one. The point two in the committee to reform the criminal law, which uh, again, what do we see there? Do we see the possibility of whatever you guys have described of the of the UAPA uh, becoming a part of the ordinary criminal law? Is that where that that committee is going? You know, that's one. Just as maybe more a speculative question. If you'll have any, both will have any thoughts on that. The 
third is in terms of the entire question of i mean i mean again manisha referred to the question of hope and said luckily i don't answer it so i'm happily asking the question do you see that as coming in in from some kind of a cross comparative to jurisdictional context you know do you think that there is signs of hope in the way criminal law reform on these questions happen in other parts of the world i think recently again there's a seminar in which justice alam spoke and he made the point of course which all of you all know is that the in the context of in terror in the uk i think the maximum period of detention is something like 14 days or 20 days you know and i'm like that's compared to 6 months in our country what is going on i mean so how do you get those kind of conversations in india has the longest yeah, yeah that's and arvin sir he didn't have questions sorry sorry arvin sir he didn't have questions he ended up asking a lot Okay, can I ask two more questions? So, should we go now? We'll stop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Arvind, I mean, we have two okay, okay. three more audience questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, then the the question of the NI, I think uh, Kunal alluded to it very uh, very elliptically, but I think that needs a lot more study. You know, we don't really have a proper understanding of how Kati operates with NI because NI is the one with the ninety percent plus conviction rate. You know, so how do we understand that ninety percent? because it's, it's striking figure they saying 90 but of course 90 of the cases in that year so if you you bring it down to over all the cases they handled still still comes to 26% which is still very 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 high you know so how do we understand that 26% is the other question which is there then uh, uh arvin that will be the last question the last very last one very last one yeah. if you have any thoughts on the up special foresight which again is a up special foresight which our colleagues in up the people people in civil liberties in particular brought up as a they, they say when you talk about the uap our concern the up special foresight because of the preventive detention authorization authorization which it has so just i'll stop with that sorry i was going to respond sorry first. manish no no I, i would either of you like to respond to arvin's barrage of questions <laughs> Menal, would you do you want to take some or should I? You start because most of you directed to you, and I'll I'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, so just very quickly trying to respond, Arvind. We can pick this conversation further later on. Now, the Article Twenty Two that you read today is after the First Amendment to the Constitution, and there's this one scholar who has traced this. His name is Tripur Daman Singh, and he's written this book called Sixteen Stormy Days that came out, I think, last year. last to last year where he is talking about what the first amendment does to civil liberties and one of the things one of the themes that he picks up is this idea of preventive detention so uh, 22 as it reads now is not 22 as it was originally designed and if you look at the initial judgments that lead to the first amendment patna high court bombay high court different high courts starting to question and strike down these preventive detention laws they are squarely using this constitutional kind of understanding of these provisions very interestingly and just as trivia the patna high court decided two cases in the span of i think a week one was pre constitution and the other one was post the promulgation of the constitution in the first case it upheld the bihar public security or public safety act as being completely fine the order of detention and externment that was ordered was was given was upheld one week later after the constitution comes in it strikes down the entire law and it says that in incompatible with these provisions of 21 22 etc it's also how personal liberty was being interpreted at that point of time prior to ak gopal it being decided right so there is there is a a, a fairly interesting um, area of um, legal history there and constitutional interpretation now of course after the first amendment 22 was made toothless by the government because they were also enacting at the same time their own preventive detention act which was enacted just i think in february it was enacted and we see the first amendment in a couple of months after that so they ensured that not 22 could not be used to challenge preventive detention laws anymore and that's the kind of starting of jurisprudence from there that starts how do we understand this phenomenon and why do courts look at this in that particular way you're right when you say that the constituent assembly did not go all out in the protection of liberties they in fact 
emphatically did not decide, they decided not to incorporate due process under Article 21, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. But there is an understanding in the CAD that this kind of abject and total use of executive power against free speech has to stop or against any kind of political activity has to stop. In fact, uh, one member, Sir Ismail Beg, said this in the debates as well. And he said this kind of law that is being invoked by provinces under colonial laws is something that's anathema to constitutional structure. So I think it was very clear in its intent as to what it wanted to do till they got power. And once they got power, they wanted to preserve and carry on with the same colonial statutes that they had been detained under themselves. So it's, it's a fairly interesting turnaround of events and law that takes place. And finally, I would say that this is also the courts adopting what in law we might call the crime control model of thinking about rights. So the state articulated the same thing, that a nascent country like India with partition turmoil, communal rights breaking out everywhere, etc., needs these special laws to prevent disintegration. And courts buy that. And you start seeing that coming from A.K. Gopalan's decision, and it permeates our constitutional jurisprudence throughout. There are only a couple of breaks that we have taken from that. I think one of the breaks that you see very clearly is Selby versus State of Karnataka by the Supreme Court. But overwhelmingly, we have held, and this goes into you know, all kinds of things, admissibility of illegal evidence, et cetera, et cetera, that if it is helping you control crime, if it is helping you maintain public order, the courts will defer to that. And that is what I think starts. And Tripur Daman Singh, of course, traces this all to the First Amendment. I am not making that claim at all. But it's interesting how that starts. So with that's my response, short response to your first question. I'll ask Mrinal to, to pitch in as regards anything else that he wants to say. Well, I, I think he had specific questions to you on the NIA, et cetera. So ah, yes. Other than, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think uh, on the broader question of where do we head, uh, are, are there approaches in other countries? Like, like you said, Arvind, I think uh, in the context of the UK, as well as the, the development of the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights and uh, at least the way Europe took up this uh, entire issue. Uh, and again, like I, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I, I thought the academics uh, in uh, in the UK as well as European uh, academics played a very important role in this by constantly highlighting what was uh, what was going wrong, and uh, and I think at the end of the day some of that has also had an impact uh, on the development of jurisprudence away from uh, uh, this sort of like vague definitions and 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 procedures. But I, I I'm not sure we've uh, I'm not sure, we haven't done that. So I think that that's where. Uh, as academics ourselves, I think that responsibility is on, on us as well to call some of these things out and uh, and uh, also give uh, uh, give that input which can be used by the judiciary if they want to uh, principled approaches to to strike down some of these things or to uh, uh, to to hold the state accountable as is when as and when uh, uh, required. So I I, I won't be that. Pessimistic, but I, I would, uh, I would say that again, we have an important role uh, to play in it. On your NIA question, Arvin, I think yeah, I completely agree that we need to study this in detail as to how these convictions are getting done, and what's and the only way to do that, according to me, is to study the trial court records of these cases, which they say are ending in conviction. Because there is no other way really, apart from newspaper reports of the odd case, that will tell us how the conviction was reached. We are lucky in this case that in Bangalore, not lucky is the wrong word, I'm sorry, but in two cases, the Chinnaswamy blast case and the Maleshwaram blast case, you will see newspapers have carried this detail that pleas were changed at the last minute, not at, after several years of trial, which was dragging on and that led to conviction. This... 90% conviction rate is a huge, huge thing to say, mm. especially considered that under TADA, the conviction rate was 2%. And under POTA, it's less than 1%, right? So much less than 1%. It would be some decimal value of tending to zero. 
And now to say that under the UAP, whenever the NIA investigates, it becomes above 90% is a huge claim. So I would approach that with a lot of caution. And I completely agree that we need to study this. This Kati argument that I mentioned is in relation to what I've seen. In my very limited uh, experience, this is what I've seen. I've heard other lawyers talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. The real tragedy is that passionate criminal defense lawyers who care about the rights of the client also do not want to challenge this practice of Kati because they say, at least my client is getting out. What do you want to do? Do you want them to spend 20 years inside? At least after seven years, this fellow is going on, going out, carrying forward, picking up the pieces of his life. Why do you want to highlight or challenge this particular issue? What is it going to achieve? And I really can't really say anything to that, you know, because that's the entire perversity of the system, that this seems to be some semblance of justice, that rational people are accepting this mechanism to at least get out. Rational decisions are being made on this account. That shows us the level of perversity that has pervaded this entire system, right? So yes, we need to study this. We need to understand how convictions are happening. Not just the mere factum of conviction versus acquittal, but how is this in fact taking place? Just to add to that, you know, uh, three, four, till three or four years ago, the NIA website used to uh, uh, upload all charge sheets, yes. all orders, everything. So you could actually look at a trial happening in real time. Yeah. But now for the last three, four years, everything is off. So there's this, there's a certain opaqueness to the way in which these convictions are also taking place. Absolutely. So there, there's no way of, very difficult to access unless you know the lawyers you know, to access any of these trial courts otherwise. So, uh, so I, I think there may be a connection between the convictions that are happening and, and what's taking place there as well. So um, I thank you all, um, Kunal and Rinal, uh, for uh, for the really insightful uh, uh, statements and uh, the discussion that that took place later on. I thank all the participants who came. We after almost two hours, we still forty four uh, of us here. So I think that kind of uh, justifies to the interest that uh, both your talks um, uh, invoked. Thank you so much. And I think this is a discussion that needs to take place uh, further. And, and I think we should all take Rinal's uh, suggestion seriously that we all apply ourselves to you know, this task because I, I, unless we all do it as researchers, as, as, as scholars, as uh, activists perhaps, there is no way we can uh, guarantee even a modicum of shift towards uh, you know, the ethical, ethical foundations of criminal law. So I think it's, we are all duty bound to do that. So uh, on that note, I think, um, uh, thank you, Raghu and BIC for organizing this. Uh, thank you all. Good thank you, Marina Kunal uh, and Manisha for taking the time to consider the nuances in the reading of the law and for allowing us uh, and future audiences a framework to think about an important law of the land. Uh, and thank you audiences for joining us today and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.